So with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 currently in cinemas, I've been binging on the film series these past few nights, and yes, as per the recommendation of many of you, I have finally caught up on Rogue Nation, which is one I never got around to seeing. I thought it was a decent installment, I really enjoyed it, but I still prefer the first Mission Impossible film, as I think it had a level of believability and intensity that the subsequent films never really recaptured for me. It's a very different movie in tone, and much less action-heavy, aside from the big action sequence on the train at the end of the movie, which is perhaps a little bit out of place in this film. It's perhaps the most far-fetched element in the movie. This film is a slower-paced, paranoia spy thriller. Even the scene transitions sometimes are often just a simple crossfade, and yet the plot and pacing work very well because it's not trying to be a thrill ride. The story takes precedence over the action scenes. Yes, the end scene with the helicopter in the tunnel chasing after the train is an attempt at a big Hollywood dramatic explosive showdown, but the rest of the film is just a solid dramatic conspiracy thriller. Unlike the later films in the series, Ethan Hunt must solely rely on his wits, ingenuity and spycraft rather than his fists. This is a story chock full of espionage, mysteries and shocking twists. It feels much more grounded and grittier than the breakneck pace sequels that followed. I think the film has, at times, an almost noirish atmosphere, especially the opening scenes in Prague. The most controversial aspect of the film is that the character of Jim Phelps, played this time by John Voight, is actually the villain. Jim Phelps, of course, was the primary character of the Mission Impossible TV series, played then by Peter Graves. Many longtime fans of the TV show understandably reacted negatively to the decision to turn the character of Jim Phelps into a traitor. This is like rebooting Star Trek and turning Captain Kirk into a villain or something. I mean, the fans would understandably be disgusted with that. I also think this was a mistake to do this to the character of Jim. What I think they should have done instead is maybe not had the character of Kittredge, maybe turned him into just Jim Phelps, an older senior IMF operative. And then that way, John Voight could just play a different character entirely. Incidentally, Peter Graves was offered the chance to return to reprise his role of Jim Phelps, but turned it down because of the decision to make Jim a traitor. I think this issue didn't really bother me personally when I saw the film, because I didn't grow up watching the original Mission Impossible TV show. I think you really have to watch this film in isolation from the TV series. My review of Mission Impossible the movie will continue right after this. But first, a word about today's partner for this video, NordVPN, a virtual private network that will help to keep you and your data safe and secure online. Nowadays, it's essential that you take steps to protect your data because your activity and personal information on the internet is becoming increasingly visible to others. NordVPN gives you next generation security features and provides advanced protection against cyber attacks, malware and trackers, and will help to block intrusive ads. You can protect all of your devices on a single subscription. Nord works on Mac, PC, Linux, iOS, Android, and even your Wi-Fi router. Whatever you're doing, whether it's streaming music, watching videos, playing games, or doing video calls, Nord's 5,200 plus super fast servers and groundbreaking Nordlinks protocol mean there's no bandwidth limits to worry about, just a robust, secure, and really fast connection. And their no-logs policy means there's no record of your web history for third parties to see. You can hide your IP address with just a few clicks and have peace of mind online. Plus, Nord have a dedicated technical and customer support with a knowledgeable and friendly staff. Use my link in the description box and download Nord today, and if you make use of the promo code Dave Cullen, you'll get one month for free when buying the two-year plan. Okay, so welcome back. So in this story, Jim's mission, which he chooses to accept, is to prevent a rogue agent and traitor named Alexander Galitsyn from stealing a CIA knock list, which is a record of all of the deep cover agents working in Eastern Europe. He intends to steal the knock list from an embassy in Prague, so the team is tasked with getting photographic evidence of the theft, shadowing Galitzin as he goes to his buyer, and then apprehending both of them. So we're introduced to Jim's team, which includes his wife Claire, along with Ethan Hunt, of course, played by Tom Cruise. So everyone is given their tasks, and it looks like a simple enough job. Ethan goes to the party in disguise, and the rest of them just go undercover. Emilio Estevez plays the character of Jack Harmon. He's the tech guy hacking the security systems from within the elevator shaft. 
Now, Jim is back in the crow's nest of the safe house, watching over everything from a distance. The mission seems to be going well. They manage to obtain the evidence they need of Galitzin at a computer apparently stealing the knock list, but then things begin to fall apart very badly. Jack is killed when the elevator starts and he can't shut it down. Jim panics and tells Ethan and Sarah that he's coming to them. He tells them to abort the mission. While Galitzin leaves the embassy, something is very wrong here. Jim tells them that he's being followed. It's not long after that he sends a final video message to Ethan, showing a gun being raised in his direction and being fired at point-blank range. The car with Hannah and Claire explodes, and Sarah is murdered along with Galitzin up against a fence. Ethan is the only member of his IMF team left. He's clearly been set up for some reason. He contacts his superiors at the IMF, that's the Impossible Missions Force, not the International Monetary Fund. He gets through to Kittredge. Shell-shocked by what just happened, he goes to see Kittredge, who's suspiciously also in Prague. Why? Well, for the same reason another undercover IMF team were present at the embassy that night. If you look carefully at the scene, you can see them throwing the odd stare at Jim's team members. Kittredge explains that they've been trying to discover the identity of a mole who was feeding information to an arms dealer named Max, who wants the knock list as part of an operation codenamed Job 314. Galitzin was actually stealing a decoy knock list tonight, meaning the whole mission was a setup. It was a mole hunt, and with Ethan the only man left standing, He's now the number one suspect, especially considering a large amount of money has now recently been deposited in his family's bank account. Ethan uses his explosive chewing gum to blow up a fish tank in the restaurant and escape in an iconic moment from the franchise. Later, he discovers that Claire is still alive. Apparently, she got out of the car. This is very surprising and a little suspicious to Ethan. He intends to meet with Max, the arms dealer, I love the scene where he uses Jim's laptop. It really reflects the era of just how new the internet was, considering most people probably hadn't even used the internet at that time. Ethan accesses the internet using something called Internet Link. The Netscape logo is on screen, though the user interface of the computer looks entirely proprietary to me. He types in Internet Access, and this is how he logs onto the internet. Very cheesy stuff. He searches for Max.com, <laughs> which today is a streaming service for HBO. But anyway, Kittredge told him that Max called the knock list operation Job 314, which Ethan realizes is a Bible reference to Job chapter 3, verse 14. So in a complete and utter guess, Ethan just decides to send an email to Max at Job space 3 colon 14, which is not, which cannot be an email address, okay? But lucky guess, because I guess it works. And Ethan's email address is job at book space of space job. <laughs> I don't know how Ethan managed to register this email address that he just made up on the fly or how it works, but he connects with Max. Don't you just love the email animations as well? Long story short, he meets with Max and tells her that the knock list in her possession is a fake and contains a tracking system. Sure enough, shortly after she uses the knock list, Kittredge shows up with some agents to raid her place, but she and Ethan escape. So the plan is that Ethan, having won Max's trust now, will break into Langley, steal the real knock list, and then she will arrange a meeting with this Job character. Ethan and Claire have to recruit two disavowed IMF agents, one of them being Luther Stickle, played by Ving Rhimes. He's the only other actor to appear in all of the Mission Impossible films, along with Tom Cruise. This is, of course, the very famous scene when Ethan is lowered into the high security room and almost hits the floor. Classic stuff. Great nail-biting scene there. Jean Renault plays the other disavowed IMF agent named Krieger, who initially helps them out, but then wants the knock list for himself. There's a wonderful scene where Ethan tricks him into believing the one in his possession is a fake. Ethan does some sleight of hand to fool him, but it's all a bluff. Another great scene. Jim returns out of the blue. Turns out he survived. He's injured, but he'll be fine. He explains to Ethan that Kittredge shot him. He's the mole. 
Well, it turns out Ethan already knows Jim's lying, having suspected he was a mole for some time. What I really like about this scene is that Ethan puts the pieces together. He's thinking out loud, pretending that he's imagining that Kittredge is the mole and the murderer of the team from the beginning, but he's actually envisaging Jim doing it all. This was a very good whodunit flashback kind of scene, but with an interesting twist. Brian De Palma's direction and the musical score is fantastic. The shot composition, the haunting music, really helps to ratchet up the tension and the unnerving discomfort of this scene. Ethan also realises that Krieger killed Sarah and Galitzin that night because he used the same knife at Langley. Ultimately, it all leads to the big showdown on the train to Paris. Ethan is due to hand the knock list to Max. Luther blocks her from uploading the list to her server. Meanwhile, Ethan tricks Claire into revealing she's been working with Jim all along because he poses as Jim in the baggage car. A confrontation ensues with the real Jim, and he shoots Claire. The final climactic action scene on the train gives the film a big crash-bang ending, including a bit of a challenge for the suspension of disbelief, but nevertheless, it's a fun scene. The visual effects may have dated a bit, but I think it still holds up reasonably well. I really like the final few moments where Ethan and Luther part ways. They're outside of a pub, and... You can hear the beautiful voice of the late Dolores O'Riordan singing, the classic Cranberry song, Dreams. The whole moment in the film is so quintessentially 90s in its vibe. I love that song. Better days, folks. Better days. The film concludes with Jim receiving an IMF-coded message for a new mission. Mission Impossible 1 or Mission Impossible 1996, whatever you want to call it, it's a very different animal to the films that followed, a much slower film, but by no means a slow film. It also has the shortest duration at 110 minutes, the only film in the franchise under the two-hour mark. I would actually compare how different the film is to how different the first few Fast and Furious movies were, compared to the films that would follow later. Though by no means do I mean to make any comparisons in terms of quality between the Mission Impossible and Fast and Furious franchises. I'm merely describing how both of these franchises have evolved considerably from their respective first installments. The tone and style of this first Mission Impossible film is unlike any that followed, not just in terms of quantity of action scenes and pacing, but the film is also light on moments of levity. There aren't any typical tension-breaking moments of humour or witty banter. This is a serious movie, and I think it's also one that gets frequently overlooked and underrated in this series. I personally think it's an awesome movie and well worth another look. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you'd like to support my work, please do so by donating via Subscribestar. The link is below. For as little as $1 a month, you can help to keep the show going. It's very much appreciated. Take care, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.